Jesus prayed for our nation. He prayed for the divisions that may fall in our country and our loved ones. He prayed that we would have a good season and give them a heart. Lord, I'm glad you take the blinders off. Jesus, you don't have to talk to you. Jesus, uh, let us respond to you today. We pray that give us that heart to be passionate. blessing that you can grab those. Uh, first announcement that we have on the slide is you're here. It's a service change uh, as far as this one stays the same, but the early service uh, is at nine, and I think people like that. We had to set up more chairs, and then we had to set up more chairs, and, and uh, had a lot of folks. Uh, the place was uh, packed this morning. Praise God. And so that's at nine, and this one's at 1030. The next announcement slide that we have is children ministry needs volunteers. God has blessed covenant with families and young families and children and many children. So two to four uh, year old, we need help with that. It's kind of a restart. People are coming back, bringing their families. And so we need adult volunteers. We've got some youth that has been helping, but need some adult volunteers with that. See Sarah Humphrey. And uh, she will uh, gladly um, be on board there with that. Uh, the next uh, announcement is May the 22nd. Save the date. It's a women's tea. Uh, I believe that's a Saturday. And uh, uh, so put that down and let others know about that. And a refuge, uh, our refuge uh, youth ministry, we've got a youth camp coming up. And so, Lord willing and prayerfully, Indian Cave, uh, June uh, 27th through July the 2nd. You've got to get, uh, by the end of May, you've got to have your forms in uh, for that. So, um, if that's you, uh, start, uh, start working towards that. Get ready. And finally, we've got our offering box here in the aisle uh, during our offering time. We have Tithely app and, and our website that you can give. Uh, your offering as well uh, for this as well. So I'm going to hand this back off to the worship team. I'm excited. They'll uh, lead us before the presence of God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's great to see your smiling faces. <laughs> well, I have faith that, that they're smiling faces, which, which is why I'm reading the scripture. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. It, it makes me think, too, that being Communion Sunday, that part of the liturgy of the church um, on, on Communion Sundays is to, to talk about the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And what? Christ will come again. A couple of the songs that we're singing now are about that second coming, really, and the joy that comes with that. That's the thing that we hope for that we have evidence of that we haven't seen. Did you hear the singers roar? 
When the lost began to see God, Jesus Christ, the saving one. And we can see that God is moving, a mighty river root the nations. The tongue and all will turn to Jesus. Bring life to heavenly gates.
Isaiah chapter 26 it says the path of the righteous is level you the upright one make the way of the righteous smooth yes Lord walking in the way of your laws we wait for you your name and renown are the desire of our hearts my soul yearns for you in the night in the morning my spirit longs for you when your judgments come upon the earth the people of the world learn righteousness Lord, you establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us.
may be seated as we go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your presence is what we need. We love you today. Lord, we need a fresh infilling of you. More of your love and your grace, your mercy. Lord, we need the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we abide with you, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Jesus, Jesus, we need you. Put us on the whole armor of God, Lord, to protect us. Go before us, behind us, to our right, to our left. Jesus, we lift up those in our congregation that need a special touch from you. We think of Pat Brewer recovering from uh, surgery on his foot. Jesus, we pray against any more infection, Lord, uh, that... Uh, Lord, that the recovery would go well and quickly. Comfort and care for him and Nancy and the rest of the family, those caring for him. Jesus, we lift up uh, faith to you and ask for your mercy and your grace. Continue to heal and, and mend and recovery for, for her, be with Tim as well. Jesus, uh, we lift up Tammy, uh, Tammy DeWitt's family, Lord, as she is with you now. Jesus, we'll miss her here. We ask for your mercy and your grace on, um, I believe, Grant, and, and uh, I'm not sure of the other uh, sons' names, and ask for your mercy and your grace upon them. Lord, comfort them. Let them know that you are there. Lord, let them come to you uh, fully. In Jesus, Jesus, we pray. Ask for your continued mercy and your grace upon um, our, our Burmese, our Myanmar brothers and sisters in Christ. Comfort and care for them as this uh, government coup and, and the rest. Jesus, let the church grow. Let it expand. And Jesus, we come to you in thanksgiving and praise for all that you have done. Uh, Lord, I think of uh, Catherine Avery's um, nephew. Lord, who's uh, getting, uh, who was able to go home yesterday. Jesus, thank you for that miraculous touch upon that little three-month baby. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We don't take that for granted. We give you honor and, and worship. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, uh, as we continue in worship, thank you for the, the gifts and the offering that we, we give. May it be a blessing to you uh, as we continue in worship and song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you make. Every bird and star is sing the fire of praise. The creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, the silver won't empty your voice. For what you have spoken, our nature and signs follow the sound of your voice. Thank you. 
may be seated. Kids, second grade and under, you're dismissed for Kids Church. Amen. I like to hear kids laugh on their way to Kids Church. Listen, guys, you may not know this, but we have a need, and the need is help with the children. We are blessed with lots of kids. You know how many churches out there would die to hear the sound of voices of kids in their church? We've got an overabundance, and we need help uh, teaching them, showing them. I am here as your pastor because there were people in this congregation who said, I want to teach rugrats and stinkers. And, uh, and so there's more of you out there called to that. So just pray about it and uh, volunteer someone else if they need the little push. Uh, to get them involved because we've got more babies on the way and, and the kids are growing and, uh, and folks are coming back. So before I start into my sermon today, um, Jenny Powell, this is her last Sunday with us uh, before she heads to Florida to be closer to the family. And I don't know if God gave us snow this week in preparation for her to like <laughs> to say I'm, I'm done with West Virginia or what, but uh, she asked if she could share a few things with you before the sermon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I came here 14 years ago when my 18 year old daughter was four years old. I came here looking for a uh, preschool. And I've stayed. And I love all of you. As I look out, I see faces of everybody, and I just love you all. And I'm going to take all of you with me mm. because all of you have poured into my life, and I'm so very grateful. There are a couple of people I really do want to say a specific thank you to. First, Dave Friend and Karen Schultz, you were the two people I met first when I came here because I interviewed you as you interviewed me (laughs) to find out if Margo would be a good fit here. We're still not sure if that worked out or not. But (laughs) (laughs) Um, I want to thank, and he's not here, but uh, Pastor Jamie Gremian, who um, I just, uh, I came, and, and uh, after interviewing with them, I thought, okay, this is a good school, but I better go to the church and find out what they're teaching on Sunday morning, because whatever they're teaching on Sunday morning, that's what they're going to teach in the school. Mm-hmm. And I came and was completely blown away. Um, uh, Pastor Jamie was uh, just, in my eyes, the phenomenal teacher of the Bible. Um, I was also blown away because Richie Stone came to me my first Sunday as I walked through that door and brought me fresh-baked banana bread. And so the person I want to thank, and I hope she's uh, watching on live or will see this, is Nancy Liston. Nancy Liston taught us hospitality because many of you don't know me. Maybe at this point, many of you don't even know who she is. She baked home-baked goods and wrapped them every week so that they could be given to uh, visitors as a sign of hospitality. I want to thank uh, Ellen Gettin, who's already in heaven waiting for us to join her, Mm. uh, because she gave me my first job. Uh, My first ministry in here was Children's Church with the twos and threes, and I did that because Ellen told me to. We need more Ellens. We need Ellens. (laughs) Ah, We need Ellens. Um, And... But then I also want to thank Ginny Taylor, because at that time, Ginny was the Children's Church uh, director. And I was going through a difficult time in my life. I was going through a divorce at that time. And Ginny showed me loving kindness uh, through that, because I called her 
the day that we separated, and I said, you know, I don't know how people are going to take it, having somebody teaching their two-year-old who's in the middle of this. And she was like, don't worry about it. Probably the same. I'd get the same word today, wouldn't I? <laughs> they needed teachers. But, <laughs> but she was just kind, just so kind. Marianne, I want to thank you so much for your mercy, and you forgave me for some really stupid thing that came out of my mouth years ago, and we've had a beautiful friendship, and I, you've shown me what it is to be merciful, and I thank you for that. Uh, Mark, I want to thank you. Where are you? There's Mark. Your leadership on the pastoral search committee led us to God's perfect answer for this church. For those of you who weren't here when Pastor Gremian left, we had a pastoral search committee. We came down to two candidates, and guess who they were? Nate and Sean. And through Mark's leadership, we ended up with God's perfect answer was to have both of these men leading us. Um, Nancy Ut, her faith just has inspired me. Just, again, for many of you, particularly those who are new, she hasn't been able to be here because her husband, Ronnie, is in poor health, and she's taking care of her son, Pat Brewer, who we just prayed for. Uh, but she is a woman of faith that is just not to be under, misunderstood. Uh, Deb, your leadership on the missions committee uh, has really taught me so much, and I'm so grateful for you and for our friendship. Um, Darren and Cheryl Stockett, you guys invited me into your home, and Daryl, you spoke to me like a brother, like, like a brother would talk to a wayward sister on occasion. <laughs> and I'm so very grateful for that because you loved me enough to speak truth into my life, and you guys opened your home to me and to those of us who are in our care circle, and I take you with me. I take you with me to Florida. Um, Joy, you personify service. If, if I could catch what God's put in your heart, I'm, I, I'll be unstoppable wherever he puts me, I know, because you are unstoppable. You are an amazing person who just inspires all of us. Yes, yes, give, yes, give Joy a hand. Sean and Amy, you guys have just personified love to me. You have shown me love and love and more love. And every time I see you, Sean, you're like, give me a hug, give me a hug, give me a hug. <laughs> uh, by the way, guys, just so you all know, I am not afraid of COVID, and anybody who wants to hug me can hug me. I'll take it. <laughs> not afraid. Not afraid. Nate and Leah, your, your servant leadership in this church has just been amazing. And I didn't know you when you were younger, but I have a feeling that if you and I had been the same age, we would have gotten into a lot of trouble together. I, I, I see that. I see I, I could really see that happening, and Deb would be all over both of us. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> so, you know, there's not time to thank everybody that's poured it. Oh, I do have to say one other thing. Sherry, Sherry, I watched you pray with my Margot, mm. the prayer of salvation when she was eight years old, and she's not here. She's, she's wandering a bit, but God's, God's word promises they'll come back. And I watched you pray that prayer with her, and it is one of the most beautiful, special moments of my life, one of the most beautiful memories. It was on a children's day downtown in the heat of July. Um, but there's not time to thank everybody, but just know that I love you, and you're all going with, with me to Florida. I'm on the west side of Jacksonville. If you're coming through, please, please, please let me know. Let me come meet you. Um, I'd love to see you all again, and we will all be partying together in heaven one day and maybe not too far away. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, before we leave today after communion and our worship time, I, I'm going to ask that we'll call Jenny up and we'll lay hands on her and we'll commission her uh, because we're all ministers of the gospel. And any time we're sent out anywhere, we're sent. And we've seen that. We've seen that in the book of Acts. We've seen that from this church. Um, my, when I think of Jenny, um, I, I think of the pastoral relations committee and the six months it took for them to come to that decision about Pastor Sean and myself. And uh, she gave me a book called Sticky Church, one of the first weeks I was here. And uh, it, it led to the formation of uh, radical discipleship groups. And uh, she also had a recommendation for family supper on Wednesday nights that sustained us, taught us a lot about fellowship and community. Her gift of teaching, 
has been prevalent, and her ideas, she is idea central uh, and, and always willing to give suggestions. And I'm so thankful that uh, we've been poured into by Jenny, and there is a congregation in Florida that needs what God has placed in your heart to build that local church. And I'm so excited about what God's going to do. And those grandkids are going to be blessed to have you. Ah, how do I preach a sermon like, whew. I, I get thrilled every week because I get to see more people that I haven't seen in a while. I like Marianne, it's so good to see you today. Um, we're in the final sermon of the book of Acts, number 69. Um, <laughs> 20 months. Two sermons per chapter, plus three introductory sermons. It has been awesome. As we've been on this journey, this this past, you know, when we started Acts, who knew? (laughs) Who knew what was coming our way, right? God did. And he said, I'm preparing you, and I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to lead you. And so Paul's ending his journey, and we're ending our journey with Acts at the same time. And so The last place we left Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta, a place he never expected to be. It wasn't on the itinerary for his prison ship to Rome. And so we we talked about how, um, guys, on our journey of life, we kind of wish we could pick what kind of ship we get to ride on, right? We want a, a cruise ship, and we want lobster, and uh, we want good music, and, and, and sometimes we end up on prison ships. Uh, and and we, we question, why? Why did God allow him to go through the storms and the, and the shipwreck and all the rest? Is it because God hated him or abandoned him? And the truth that we came to was there were 275 men on that boat with him that needed to see Jesus. And Paul was to look like Jesus in the midst of the storms. And so you are going through the storms that you're going through because someone in your life around you needs to see Jesus and you're the one called to that moment. Well, he shipwrecked on the island of Malta and when things had a chance to get better, the natives of Malta were friendly. They built a fire and all the rest. And and Paul's helping with that as he's collecting fire. A venomous snake decides to bite him. And... uh, the, the inhabitants of the island immediately say, this guy must be a murderer because he escaped the wind and the waves and the storm and the shipwreck and yet fate decides that he still should die. And the reality of the fact was Paul was a murderer. Was. He was saved and sanctified and set apart by Jesus Christ. And he shook off that snake in the flames. And I love how Scripture desc- this, the, you know, describes this. It's like they're sitting around watching him. When is he going to blow it up and die? <laughs> and every moment that he's still breathing is another moment where they say, this guy is different. I love, um, I love the book of Judges. I know it's a weird book to love. Uh, but I love Gideon's story in the book of jo- Judges when God calls him to, to, to tear down all the idols in his hometown, and he does it under the cover of night, and everybody was like wants to kill him because he destroyed their idols, and, and Gideon's father says, hold on a second, if, if these are real gods, we don't need to defend them. Let's let them take care of my son and see what happens. So they call him Jerob Baal, which means let, let Baal contend with him. And every day that Gideon lives, Baal is declining and and Yahweh God rises up. And that's exactly what happens in this scenario. Paul's alive. He's bitten by a venomous snake. Then he goes on to to the ruler of that island. His father's deathly ill and, and, and Paul brings them healing. And then it says everybody that was sick on the island comes to Paul and they all get healed. And so he has this three month mission trip that he never planned, but was according to God's design. And that's Life in the Spirit in a nutshell, guys. That's what we've seen throughout the book of Acts, and that's what we've experienced ourselves, is every day is a new day. Every day is a new day where, where God sings over us as we sleep, and we wake up, and the Holy Spirit's got a path for us, a journey for that day, and we wake up, and, and, and we seek His face, and we get in His Word, we get in His teaching, and we say, Holy Spirit, take me where you will. And wherever we find ourselves, we know that God's in control. And that's his purpose and plan for us that day. 
And so we've watched Paul do these most amazing, stupendous things, but I don't want you guys to look past the fact that it happened day by day by day. And what he did every day was the same, how he lived, how he pursued God. And so he did these extraordinary things, but it was just because he did those four things daily. He prayed. He got into God's Word. He was in Christian fellowship and he was in communion. He had breaking of bread with one another and with God. And so that's our encouragement today, guys, is that's who we're designed to be. That's who we're called to be. And so all of our callings are unique and different. We're all going to go through storms and battles and all the rest. But it's because that's our God's calling uniquely for our lives. And so we can spend our whole life being angry at God and upset with God that our, our path and our journey doesn't look like somebody else. Or we can just submit to the fact that, God, you're God, and you designed me, and you know me, and you gave me these gifts and talents and abilities, and I don't have a say-so. So I'm going to surrender to you, and whatever you lead me to, that's what I'm going to do. And that is a joyful, fulfilled, complete life in Christ. That's what we're called to do. But, but we all have that tendency. I mean, Peter did it, right? You remember when Peter got called the third time? And, and so, so Jesus starts describing what Peter's going to go through, and Peter says, well, what about John over here? I want his journey. And God says, no, 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 that's his journey. This is your journey. Embrace your journey. Embrace your journey. And I'm so thankful, Jenny, that our journey brought us on this path I got eight years with you, wasn't enough, but, but embrace where God takes you, where he leads you, and where he calls you to stay. So now, Paul is, is getting ready to, to head to Rome. He's going to finish his journey, three months on the island of Malta. What kind of brought him through, all of that was the promise of God. God promised him, you will get to defend yourself and the faith in front of Caesar. So when he got bit by that snake, he just shook it off in the fire. Because the promises of God stood and he believed it. Guys, you're going to get bit by people. You're going to get bit by the enemy. Shake it off. Shake it off. Because nothing stops the purposes and plans of God. Acts chapter 28, verses 11 through 16. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island. An Alexandrian ship with the twin gods at its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Rigium. A day later, a south wind began blowing. So the following day, we sailed up the coast to Pichuli. Then we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the Three Taverns, and when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Just a coincidence that on the island that they shipwrecked, an island they didn't recognize at first, this 14 by 9 mile wide island, there is a ship that docked there for the winter that's uh, the, the same size and the same type vessel that could carry the 276 men that were shipwrecked on the island. Just a coincidence can't write this stuff, right, Steve? God had a plan. They probably thought, we're never getting off this thing. And there on the other side of the island was this ship waiting for them when the time was right. God's purposes and plans never fail. Now, why does Paul mention this twin-headed uh, face on the front of the ship? You know, we've got our, our playground ship out there. I don't know what we're going to put on the front there. I, I know we're going to put the, 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 the Christian flag or, or the covenant flag at the top. I get that. But typically on a ship or a vessel, they would put some, some being, some idol or something to guide the boat. That, that was their protectorate. And so Paul describes this twin-headed God. So this, the God that's on the front of this vessel is, is the two sons of Zeus that were Castor and Pollux. We, we know these, these twin sons more likely when we look up at the stars because the, 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 the Gemini constellation is named after these twin sons. So, so you have Gemini up there. And uh, the thing about the, the twin sons of Zeus is they were supposed to be the protectors of sailors. 
That, that was their role. Now, I can't tell you definitively why Paul mentions them in this passage, but I do know that we only got 28 chapters, right, of the book of Acts, and every detail in Scripture is there for a reason. So, the way I see the reason why he includes this, this twin-headed figurehead is it's almost like a laughter, right? Like, those guys are going to protect us, right? We know who's the real protector of sailors, the God of Paul, the God that said that what we just went through, he didn't let none of us die in the midst of the wind and the waves and the storm. Those gods aren't going to protect us. And so the men that were probably of, of, of Greek descent or, or Roman, we know there were Roman soldiers, there was a Roman centurion with them. These, they could have very easily believed in these gods and these myths but now they've experienced the reality of Jesus Christ through Paul, and they're not trusting in those twin gods anymore. They're trusting in our God. And, uh, and so the question I want to give to you right now is, who are you trusting in to lead you safely through the journey of life? Who are you trusting? Are you trusting your own talents and abilities? Your own knowledge, your own know-how? That doesn't work good for four-year-olds. And it doesn't work good for 40-year-olds, to be honest, right? We've got to trust in someone greater than ourselves. Don't trust in government. They'll let you down. Don't trust in power and position. Don't trust in your job. You can't even trust the weather as we saw this last week. Who are you trusting to bring you through the storms in life? Our God is not one that says, you have to prove yourself to me. No, no. Our God is the one that says, depend on me, lean on me, take up your cross and follow me. Who, who are you following? Who are you depending on? We have a perfect protector in Jesus. Now the rest of their journey is fairly easy as the wind is now favorably from the south. And so they can make almost daily stops in the different cities. And so as you can see on the map, uh, they were just south of of Italy and Rome, and so this part of the trip goes by really quickly. Um, at Pichuli they, and, and Rome, they found other believers, and the question that comes to me is these other believers in, in Pichuli, they, they say, stay with us a week, and the, the question that rises up with me is why? Why would they stay a week with these believers? I know why Paul would, but why would the guys with him, why would the soldiers taking him to Rome, why would this commander say, yeah, we'll stick around a week? I mean, they were in such a rush that they left the safe haven to try to get to Rome quicker. And after spending three months on this island, they're probably ready to get back to their homes and their families and their lives. Why would they pause for a week just outside of Rome? Again, I don't have a clear answer for you other than to say, I think they found somebody in Paul that they didn't want to leave. I want more time with this guy. I've never met anybody like this. I want to learn more about this God. Maybe, and we're not told this, maybe they've become believers themselves. And they're building relationships and communities. But I know, um, I know that, that that was something that they did. I know in my life, uh, there are friends that I've had most of my life that I love. Um, I don't know how everybody else is wired, but the way I'm wired, if I make a friend with somebody, I'm a friend for life. I'm going to be loyal no matter what. If I haven't seen you in 20 years, when we meet, we're going to, we're going to catch up quick. That's just the, that's the way I'm wired. Um, I, I have friends that I've had for my whole life that I'm excited to see. But if I'm honest with you, after a couple hours, I'm drained. I, I'm worn out. I'm like, okay, I had my fill. I'll see you in a couple years. You know, not, not that that's a mean thing. <laughs> Maybe it is a mean thing. But what I'm getting at is, is I don't have everything in common with them. Acts 2 told us that the early church had everything in common because they were committed to Jesus first. And I can testify that anytime I'm around other believers, whether it's the first time I'm meeting them or their old friends, I get impassioned. I get rejuvenated. I get filled. It's like full encouragement. So can you imagine Paul after this long trip finally being with other believers and they're pouring into him and he's encouraging them and whoa what life it is. 
if there's anything we've realized over, over these, you know, this last year and a half or so, is our need for Christian fellowship. It's, it's one of the four things. If you're starving and, and you've been in the Word and you've been in prayer, get around other believers. Don't let any, any fear of anything keep you from Christian fellowship because it's life to you. It's so essential to make time to spend with believers. Finally, Paul makes it to Rome. And when he does, there's believers waiting for him with open arms. Now, remember in Jerusalem, it wasn't just the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders that didn't like Paul. Remember when he went to Rome and he met with the leaders of the church? They said, we got to tell you, Paul, that there are Christian believers that don't like you. Because they don't like that you're bringing Gentiles to the faith, and they think you're speaking against uh, Jewish law and practices and all the rest, and they don't care for you. So Paul may be wondering when he gets to Rome, are these believers going to receive him? Are they going to accept him? And he finds that they do. Um, And it's a wonderful meeting that encourages Paul so much so that he thanks God. Any time that believers can gather, it can bring encouragement and life. Take the time to do it. Again, one of the lessons I think we're learning from COVID is we don't have to rely on any church or any church structure, Christian structure, to tell us when we're supposed to gather together. We don't have to wait for a family supper. We don't have to wait for a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. We just need to call and meet up with each other. We just need to gather. And it doesn't have to be a big group. And it doesn't have to have a a full worship setting. And it, it doesn't have to have lights or some great experience. Guys, when two or more gather in his name, he is with us. And there's power. I get fired up every week when I meet with certain brothers or sisters in Christ. It can't be helped. It, it, it's something that needs to occur. In many ways, guys, this was a fresh start for Paul and his ministry. Remember, the door was closed in Jerusalem. He couldn't walk on the street without somebody trying to kill him. He was in prison in Caesarea Maritima for two years. And all that time, I'm sure he's wondering, when I get to Rome, what's it going to be like? God's promised I'm going to be in Rome. It's going to happen. And so he, now that he's arrived, the door's wide open. Yes, he's a prisoner. They put him on house arrest. He gets to live in a home where people get to come and see him. Yes, there's a guard. That guard that's supposed to keep him in that house. But that guard is also going to protect him from anybody coming in to try to attack him. You see what God's done? Paul is now in the capital city of the Roman Empire. He's in Rome, and God has provided a culture and environment ripe to reach people with the gospel. And so as Christians, we must look at our circumstances and situation through God's perspective. Most of us, if we're honest, and if we were in Paul's shoes, we would have been like, it took forever to get here. Oh, that was the worst boat trip ever. I even got bit by a snake. I was hungry. I was waterlogged. I just, it was terrible. The native food on Malta was gross. Like, I mean, you could come up with whatever reason to complain. You could say, oh, now I'm stuck in Rome. I got to be in a house all the time. I can't walk the streets. I got this guy guarding me all the time. This is such a pain. Why am I here, God? I'd rather do this, 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 and this. That's man's perspective. God's perspective. You got a free trip to Rome. Everything paid for. Everything provided. You don't even have to work the ship. Just stay in the hull. Yeah, you're in chains, but... Free trip to Rome. The nice destination vacation for three months on the island of Malta. You're in a home rather than a prison cell. I think that would be a nice change for him, right? People can come and go and see you as they please. You're in a season in life where you don't have to go to people, they come to you. And then this prison guard, yeah, he may look big and mean and tough, but guess what? His job 
is to stand there and guard me. So I can talk to him about Jesus till I'm blue in the face, and he won't leave. It's like those, you know, those English guards, you know, that they, people make, and they just stand there, you know, with the Q-tips on their heads. It's like that. He's like, this guy is my prisoner. I'm not his. And now the most powerful nation in the world, my enemy is now my defender because this guy is not going to let anybody hurt or attack me or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, no person is our enemy. Our enemy is Satan and our self, our selfish, sinful nature. God can turn our enemies into our allies. And that's what he does for Paul. Could it get any better? Let's see. Verses 17 through 22. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders and he said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, we have no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here. But we want to hear what you believe, for only the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So the question is, did it get any better? (laughs) Yes, it got better. Paul, every city he's ever gone into, what is the first thing that he's done? He's found the Jewish leaders in that city and tried to connect with them. I love that about Paul. Because every city he went to, he could have thought, who's gone on ahead of me and soured these people against me? He could have been in Rome saying, I can hide out in my home arrest and not have to worry about these guys, not even deal with them. Maybe they don't know anything about me. I can just pass it on. But Paul knows that he's on mission. He knows that he's called to reach Rome with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's going to start the same way there that he has everywhere else. He says, I want to meet with you Jewish leaders. Come to where I am, and I want to tell you why I'm here. He he doesn't lie. He's bold because God has called him there. Guys, you can be bold wherever you find yourself because God has brought you to that point. No person has power over you. God is in control. And so as he meets with these Jewish leaders, he says, yeah, I'm in chains. Yeah, the the leaders in Jerusalem, the most powerful Jewish leaders in the world, they hate me so much they want to kill me. I I can't deny that. But let me explain to you why. Let me tell you that I haven't broken any customs or traditions. They, They did imprison me. Rome's had me, but Rome wanted to release me. They couldn't find a reason why I should die, but those leaders protested to the point where I appealed to Caesar. I didn't think I had another option, but even appealing to Caesar, I'm not going to attack our brethren. He starts off this whole discussion by calling them brothers. Remember that, guys. Every chance he got to testify, he identified with the people he was ministering to. You're not my enemy. Even though you're not my brother in Christ yet, I still see you as my brother or my sister. And then he goes on to say, the reason I've really called you here today is I want to tell you about Jesus, the Messiah, the hope of centuries. I have good news for you. I love this about Paul. Most of us would just stop on defending ourselves. Let me tell you what's, what's why I'm the good guy and they're the bad guy. He doesn't do good guy, bad guy. He says, Jesus. Jesus. And their response? We don't know who you are, dude. I mean, you you sent us a letter, we're here meeting with you, but we haven't heard anything from any religious leader in Judea. They didn't send anybody up here to talk about you. Clean slate. We don't know who you are, Paul, but we have heard of this Jesus and this movement called The Way, And all we know is that it's denounced everywhere, and so we're curious. We'd love to hear what you have to say. I love this. Because Paul, when he called them into this house, probably thought, oh, they're going to be turned against me. This is going to be sour. 
All the experiences that he's had for the previous two to three years have been awful. And then he finds them not only unaware of his existence, (laughs) but also eager to learn about Jesus, an open door right for the harvest, everything inside that prison cell. Can you imagine the harassment of the enemy as he's sitting in that prison cell in Caesarea Maritima waiting for his chance to go to Rome? Oh, Paul, you're going to hate the rest of your life. Paul, you're going to face adversity everywhere. Paul, you, you might as well just kill yourself in this jail cell because it's only going to get worse from here. I mean, even John the Baptist, right, when he was in, in Herod's prison, called out to Jesus, sent his disciples to Jesus to clarify, I'm in this prison cell and I'm probably going to die here. I better make sure that you're really the Messiah. And Jesus says, look, let the blind see, the lame walk, the dead rise again, demons flee, I'm the guy. So imagine the relief on Paul's face. You don't know me? That's awesome. That's awesome. I love the irony that the believers in Rome knew Paul was coming, but the Jewish leaders had no idea who he was. The believers in Rome knew Paul was coming. Now, it's, it's not like they could check their app and their ticker and see when Paul's flight was going to arrive. You know, it's not like that they would get a text message saying, his, his, his flight is boarding at this time. And no, when they knew Paul was coming to Rome, that means that they had to go down to the docks every day and see if he showed up. That means that they were waiting expectantly. They were excited about it. And here you have these people so venomously angry and hating Paul and the message of Jesus Christ that they want him dead They don't even take the time to send a message or messenger to Rome to carry on their hostility against Paul. They just send him to Rome. And so their attacks against Paul was an attempt to kill the message of Jesus Christ, but instead it opened the greatest door possible for Paul to tell the known world through Rome about Jesus. They thought they were killing the gospel, and they just set it free. They... The, the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem established the church in Rome. God's perspective. God's plan. God's way. Guys, persecution is coming. When I first got here, I know Deborah and Jenny remember this. You remember I said in that sermon, maybe we need to pray for persecution. And you're like, No. Why in the world would we pray for persecution? But the idea behind that was the church was so stagnant that God couldn't work and move. And it's in times of persecution and difficulty, as we've just experienced, where we shake off all that stuff that distracts us and we get real about our faith. And so that's what's happened here with Paul. So don't believe the doom and gloom that you're told. The storms that are rapidly approaching. Jesus wins. I know you guys know this because we're most of us are Mountaineer fans, right? We know about doom and gloom. We know about getting our hopes up and being crushed. Listen, we never lose. Jesus has won. I love watching old Mountaineer bowl games where they win, because I'm like, we're down by 20 points, wait till you see the end. That's our life! We know how it ends! So no matter what you're going through, illness or disease or job loss or or chaos or fear, don't believe it! Because God is working out a scenario where there's a ripe harvest field opening up right now! And we're sent and we're called. Got me all fired up. But think of the contrast in Paul's experience in Israel and what he's experiencing now in Rome. Guys, we're going to have those moments. But we're also going to have the Rome moments. 28, 23 through 30, the end of the book. So a time was set on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. 
Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Let me just pause there a second. You guys get tired of me after 45 minutes. But can you imagine a morning to evening with Paul? Just having him encapsulate and open up the scriptures and talk about life experience and all the rest. These guys don't know how good they have it. Verse 24, some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you, when you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they, they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know that the salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and no one tried to stop him. Paul's home prison became the first church of Rome where he got to safely share the gospel. He no longer had to go to them. They came to him. He had this entire day. He just, I mean, just blasted it wide open. And as a result, some believed and some didn't. Let me remind you, your job is not to save people. If it were, then we would have a military here today. I'd be equipping you guys with guns and ammo, and we would be bringing people to the point of death saying, receive Jesus or die. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples to get a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane so he could tell them to put it away, not to use it. So I want to tell you today, guys, that our role is to testify to the truth, to speak to our experience, to introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ, and then let them choose. But our job is to help give them that choice, clearly, by our lives and by our testimony. Obviously, Paul hoped that they would all receive and believe, as we do. And when it didn't happen, he quotes Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, and I love how he quotes it, because he doesn't give off the ship to Isaiah. He said, the Holy Spirit said to your ancestors through Isaiah. I, I love it, because that brings us full circle, right? Isn't the whole book of Acts about the Holy Spirit, and the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit that, that, that hovered over the waters of the deep of creation? The Holy Spirit that worked in power through the ministry of Jesus? The Holy Spirit that... that, that um, uh, inspired the word of God, protected and preserved it for generations, and reveals its truth to our hearts. And he says in this moment, the Holy Spirit that is the one that abides with me fully and completely, that has led me from being a murderer and a hater of Jesus and a persecutor of Jesus to who I am today in chains for Jesus in Rome. This same Holy Spirit said to Isaiah, to your ancestors, and he's saying to you today this. You've seen you don't believe your eyes. You've heard, but you haven't listened. Your hearts are hard. Jesus wants to heal all, but he can't. Not because he's not able to, or not because he doesn't desire to, but you won't let him. The last two verses of the book of Acts say this. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense, he welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Paul lived the same way, whether he was free or in chains, whether he was in one country or the next, where he knew what tomorrow brought or not, he did the four things daily and was a champion for Jesus. God gave him two years in Rome. And I love it. I love how it ends on no one tried to stop him. Oh, you think you can stop Jesus? Remember what Gamaliel said? Stop! Leave these men alone. 
Because if they might be the work of men, they'll fail. But if they're from God, you won't be able to stop these men. Paul's teacher said that. And it's true. No one can stop them. Rome guarded defense for two years so the church could get established in the capital of the world. Now, why does it end here? Why don't we get the conclusion of Paul's life? How many of you would love to hear what Paul said before Caesar? Or how Caesar responded to him? How many of you would like more? How many of you are like, ah! Can they find like a Dead Sea Scroll with like 29 and 30 in there somewhere? You know, what, what, why does it end here? So many books of the Bible end with a question. Jonah ends with a question. God says, I, I showed you grace with a whale, a great fish. I showed you grace with a vine that gave you shade in the heat. And you mourned when a worm ate that vine. But you don't show compassion for a whole people group that is on the verge of death. He asks him a question about grace. And Jonah never answers the question because the question wasn't just intended for Jonah. It was intended for us. And so Paul ends his discussion with these religious leaders in the same way he's ending the discussion with us. I gave you 20 months of teaching on Acts so that you could see with your mind's eye the reality of the truth and you could hear with your ears the testimony of how I established the early church and what a Christian following the Holy Spirit looks like. But what are you going to do with it? Where's your heart? I want to heal you. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to stay sick? Do you want to stay trapped in fear? Do you want to be convoluted with doubt? Do you, do you want to be crushed and destroyed and, and live a, a mediocre Christian life? Or do you want to be healed? Today the Holy Spirit is calling your heart. And he's saying... I had Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Stephen. For those seasons, that's who they were supposed to be. They, they fulfilled the calling. But now I have Jennies, and I have Deborahs, and I have Sean's, and I have Chester's, and I have Anthony's, and I have Renee's, and I have Rob's. Will you go and be? And let me lead you where you are today. It stops on chapter 28. But we're in chapter 2021. And God's writing right now. We're going to be in that story that he gets to read for us on the other side. Are you going to be the type of person that when you're in glory for a thousand years, you're still meeting people that are coming to you saying, I'm here because you were shipwrecked on the island of Malta for three months. Jesus, We don't want to settle anymore. Holy Spirit, we want all of you in our life. Forgive us for wanting the good experiences, the dramatic, the fun stuff. What's all about us and not embracing the storms and the snake bites, and the chains, and knowing that that was your will for us, Lord, so that others might have what we have with you. Jesus, I know, I know, I know, because you shared your heart with me, that this room is full of people who will be in our world changers for Jesus Christ. 
and you want to undo the shackles of their soul, and you're breaking down the walls of their heart even now, and you're setting them ablaze. And Lord Jesus, the fullness and the gifting of the Holy Spirit is ready and waiting, and we just have to say yes. So pour out your healing today. Bring physical healing to cancerous bodies even now. Take away the effects of diabetes, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that you would take away depression and, and mental illness, Lord. Sinful, terrible, destructive habits would flee in this moment. But more than any of that, Lord Jesus, I pray that the disease of the soul where we've held back from you and we haven't surrendered all, I pray right now that as the cross of Jesus Christ put the final nail in the coffin of death so we would be set free and be ablaze for you right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We get to celebrate Jesus' life, death, and resurrection right now through communion. Pastor Sean, Pastor Steve, if you would come, I'm going to do things differently. This is more like how we used to do it. Pastor Sean, I'm going to have you stand here. Pastor Steve, I'm going to have you stand here. I'm going to open up the trays. I'm going to bless the elements. And folks, you just come and receive as God calls you. You can receive at the altar with your cup, your wafer, and and your juice. We have gluten-free crisps here if you needed the gluten-free option. But I'm going to invite you to come And just, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to Elizabeth City to do revival next week, and I'm not going to be here next week. I'm going on sabbatical the month of June. I I don't know where God's taking us next with the teaching that He's going to give me. But for now, guys, in this moment, He just wants you. He wants you. Not through me, not through anybody else. He just wants you. And so I'm going to invite you to do that. Lord, take the, the, the common juice and wafer and make it holy. You can make even the most worthless, wretched things and make them clean and pure. And you're going to do that today. I know it, Lord. So bless these elements, and as we receive it, God, let us receive again your death for our death, your life for our life, your blood transfusion through our veins, a new creation in Christ. Let the old die and the new come. In your name we pray. Amen. You just come as God leads you. They'll be standing here with the cups. You take and receive. And and then you come at the altar as you will. Stay in your seat. Whatever God leads you to, just come. John, go ahead and and go ahead and play some worship music. You just delight in Jesus.